Hey everybody, I've got a video here for you today, and I did some reading last night, and I think I'm going to try to answer uh, a common question I have received over the past year or two, and this video here, the Ignored Sphinx Inscription, I just did a little reading this day and talked about my thoughts on this. I just thought it was interesting. I never really have time to make uh, in-depth or fancy videos, but mainly what you get is just my thoughts and ideas on things and this was an interesting read there was stuff that was found inscribed on the left paw of the sphinx and there were many researchers that went into giza about 200 years ago and tried to do excavation work and really tried to put together a story on these ancient monuments and this is one of the videos i did on it and i just want to go a little more in deeply to this today because in looking into the Giza Plateau, you got to look at the history and what was actually found here. And some of it is not the story we have been getting today, and certainly not from Egyptologists. But what I found, I thought this was rather incredible. And I just want to do a little reading here. This is the Pyramid Text Online, and this is a book written almost 200 years, or yeah, almost 200 years ago by a Richard William Howard Weiss, and this is called Operations Carried On at the Pyramids of Giza in 1837 with an account A Voyage into Upper Egypt, Volume 3. And this is one of three books he did on this. But in the end of his last book, just in an appendix at the end, he puts in a little chapter on the Sphinx. And I want to read. This monument, so imposing to its aspect, even in its mutilated state to which it has been reduced has always excited the admirations of those who possessed sufficient knowledge of art to appreciate its merit at first glance for though to an untutored eye there remains so little of the features as scarcely to give more than a general idea of the human head yet by repeated and accurate observation the several parts may be sufficiently traced to afford a tolerably complete idea of its original perfection. The contemplative turn of an eye, the mild expression of the mouth, and the beautiful disposition of the drapery at the angle of the forehead sufficiently attest to the admirable skill of the artist by whom it was executed. It is true that no great attention has been made to those proportions which are accustomed to admire, nor does the pleasing impression which it produces result from any known rule adapted in its execution, but it may rather be attributed to the unstudied simplicity of the conception, to the breadth, yet high finish of several parts, and to the, and to the stupendous magnitude of the whole. Such are the sentiments which a repeated view of this extraordinary work has inspired. At first, I confess that I, like many other travelers, I felt that the praises lavished upon it by Norden, Dendon, and others were exaggerated. But the more I studied it at different hours of the day, and under different effects of light and shade, the more I became convinced of their having barely done justice to its merits. It must indeed be allowed that the drawings by both these gentlemen but faintly accord with their, and I can't really read that next word, but after having repeated the same task myself with little success, I must admit that the difficulties which attend the undertaking are sufficient to baffle the efforts of anyone not professionally dedicated to the arts. And this is really small print, and I'm just trying to get through this the best as possible. But let me go on and do some reading of these excavations that were done over 200 years ago. And Robert Temple goes into some early history of people that did studies on the Sphinx and what they actually found. Now, before I proceed, I must premise that the general impression made upon me by this monument has been produced by deliberate contemplation of it when laid open to its base with the fragments of a beard resting beneath the chin with its paws stretched fifty feet in advance, and with the temple, the granite tablet, 
and the altar represented in the accompanying sketches spread out on a regular platform in its front. And I've had questions, is the Sphinx placed on a platform? Well, that's a very good question. These interesting objects, which no one for ages had had opportunity of seeing, have undoubtedly tended to exalt in my estimation and in order that I may endeavor to convey something of the same feeling to others, I shall proceed to a detailed account of what was discovered by Captain Caviglia, which together with several sketches taken on the spot during the progress of his operations, may remain as a record of his labors when the objects themselves are destroyed or again entombed in the moving sands. And he has an account of the worker is working for seven days and barely making any progress because he describes just a river of sand constantly flowing into this enclosure when they were trying to excavate it. And that's really, I guess, why it has been entombed by sand for so long is just because it's a monumental task to keep the sand out of it, and especially in ancient times. It says, from varying reports in circulation in Egypt, I was given to understand that the French engineers had made co a considerable excavation in the front of the Sphinx, and that they had just discovered a door at the time when they were compelled to suspend their operations. And I guess there was some sickness on these workers, and there were some other problems, and they just had to stop what they were doing, they only had so much time, so much money, but right before they stopped, they discovered a door. This account was confirmed by the repeated ass assertions of the Arabs, several of whom declared that they had been present at the time of the discovery, and said that the door led into the body of the Sphinx, while others affirmed that it was conduct conducted up to the second pyramid, Though little stress could be laid upon such statements, yet they rendered Captain Caviglia very unwilling to give up his researches without at least doing all his power to ascertain the fact. And it talks about the deep trench, and let me just go on here. And here is fragments of the beard, and they had some art on the side of it, and this beard was... Uh, constructed by every account in the 18th dynasty and a writer from the Greek time about 2200 2300 years ago says that the Sphinx was a tomb of Amos or Amos the very first ruler of the 18th dynasty but a clear mistake was made and what it actually says is that the Sphinx was the tomb of Tutmosis, who I clearly identified in every respect, and even the angle of the face, the history, his opportunity, and the whole reason why he put his face on the Sphinx. It is clear from reading this about the beard and the history of the beard and what people were writing about a possibility of the Sphinx being a tomb for Tutmosis. It's clear his face is on the Sphinx. That's all I'll say about that. And it talks about the excavation more work here and talks about the beard. It says most of these fragments were found in a small temple 10 feet long and 10 feet broad, which was immediately below the chin of the statue, which, according to Pliny, contained the body of Amasis. And this is a mistake, and it says a little later how he mistook Amasis for Tutmosis. It says, soon after this discovery, a large block of granite on the eastern side, of which figures and hieroglyphics were beautifully inscribed, found in the small temple, together with two other tablets, composed of calcareous stone. And here he gives a diagram of what was found in front of the Sphinx, when there was excavations done about 200 years ago. Have you ever seen this before? The stairs leading down, and they said that there was a doorway found leading under the Sphinx. Here is what we have today. 
and it's clear. And remember, this is about six, seven stories high. So a person standing down here would be, you know, quite small. And this is a rather large area here. I mean, it looks small here, but when you actually realize how big this area is and you compare it to this, where the corners are of this pedestal, and you compare this to where this ledge leads off and the obvious sloping and the cover up of something in front by this platform. What are they really trying to hide with this platform here? Is this a really necessary platform or is there an ulterior motive to this purpose in here? You can kind of see what could be the edges of these stairs. And there was also, it was reported, a door found under here and People doing these excavations work 200 years ago weren't putting out, you know, crazy stories for YouTube hits. They were trying to deduce what was actually here at the time, and they would have no reason to lie. There was an altar. There was stairs going down into the temple of Tep2F. And I will be going more into this. I just don't have a lot of time today, but I thought this was extremely interesting. And there is inscriptions on the left paw that say this monument was the guardian of Osiris. And there is only one guardian of Osiris, and that was the great god Anubis upon his shrine. The stairways leading up to the Sphinx, and he talks about the shadow, the trick of the shadow of the light of day, how it plays on the Sphinx. Well, what is it about the latitude or whatever 30 degrees that the Great Pyramid and Sphinx are located on? Does anybody know the special shadow play that is done at that latitude? I just found this whole, in, this whole article interesting, this whole book interesting. A clear diagram of what is in front of the Sphinx, he would have no reason to lie. I'm going to be going more into this when I have time. Hope you thought this was interesting and you all have a very nice day.